he's one of the most devastating fighters out there. But if you can't think yourself out of a given situation, then what's the point? Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 522, with today's guest, Sayaji David Osborne. Who am I? Well, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for this show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to find everything that we're working on, including our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that'll save you 15% off a new shirt, a hat, one of our training programs, or anything else that we have over there. Martial Arts Radio gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We keep it easy. You'll see two new episodes each week over there. And the goal here of this show is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to help guarantee future episodes of this show, there are lots of ways you can help. You could make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend, pick up a book on Amazon, maybe leave a review, or support our Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's the place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as $2, and at $5 and up, you're going to get more content. The more you're willing to contribute, the more we're going to give back. Today's guest holds a distinction. Here we are, more than five years into martial arts radio, and we've talked to people representing just about every martial art you can imagine. Well, Sayaji Osborne not only came on and talked about his story, his journey as a martial artist, but he also talked about the martial art he trains in which is one you may have heard of, but he's the first to come on the show and talk about it. It was a fun conversation, an educational conversation, and one that I am sure you'll enjoy. Sayaji Osborne, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, sir, for having me. Hey, thanks for being on. Thanks for, for your willingness to do this. Now, you, we were talking before we got rolling here about, about the title and and... I'm sure the listeners know, you know, my, I really try to make sure I pronounce things right, titles and people's names, because I, I think that's important. And you yeah. said that that title is from Myanmar. It's, it's Burmese. Yeah. And um, I'm, I mean, I, I, I know there are martial arts that have, you know, popped up everywhere. Is, is, that, is that where your training comes from? My training comes, I'm a uh, direct student of the gentleman that brought it here to the United States uh, over 55 years ago, uh, great grandmaster uh, Wu Meng Ji. Uh, he is the supreme grandmaster of, of uh, Burmese Bondo here in America. And so he came Burmese here. Burmese Bondo? Is that what you said? Yeah. Burmese Bondo is the system. Um, there are various uh, approaches to uh, Bondo, but it, it has been interpreted or defined as way of the disciplined warrior uh, or way of the stone-faced warrior, uh, systems of self-defense are, how should I say, there's a derivative or a branch of Bondo called Fang which is spelled T-H-A-I-N-G. There is a component called Lit Way. Uh, That is L-E-T-W, it's either W-H-E-I or W-E-I, depending on the spelling. But it is basically uh, Burmese kickboxing. And it is cousin to systems like Thai boxing, okay? Uh, then you have, which is along the sports, and then you have the uh, internal system. Um, you know, every all the complete systems, what I mean by that is the ancient systems have uh, categories, and you have, we're broken down into what's called athletics, and aesthetics, and you have the, the uh, sport of it, okay? Yeah, yeah. With, if you would like, uh, the aesthetics are more along the lines of forms, or we call them akas, um, spelled A, 
H K A means form. Okay, and then you have uh, the Bondo uh, Let's Way, which is a kickboxing. And then, as I stated before, you have Fang, which is more of a defensive system. It uh, contains the animal systems. Bondo also possesses animal systems, as with uh, systems like Chinese Kung Fu and Indian uh, Kalari Payat and various systems around the world. Um, I just am elated that I was privileged and still, I'm still a student. I'd like to let you know that we have uh, what's called levels in our system as opposed to degrees. And um, they're being, the, the influence that I have is more Chinese based and circular, but there are other systems of Bondo, the nine animal systems, that are comprised of different strategies and uh, healing methods and fighting methods. Each animal has a particular uh, approach to combat or sport or the healing side of it for that matter. And I'm sure I've got the same question now that most of the listeners have, which is how did you end up in a system that is so rare here in the U.S.? I, you're, I'm, well, gonna, I'm pretty sure you're the first Bondo practitioner I've spoken with ever. And I don't just mean on the show. I mean, ever in my life. Well, I consider that a privilege and a, and a high honor because um, I have practiced, you know, Bondo people are just very, how should I say, we're, we abide by the law. We're family oriented. There's nothing. It is a closed door system. It's highly traditional. You are selected. It's nothing uh, cliquish or cultish. It is just a way of life. And a lot of the senior brothers and sisters in the system are just like that. They're lawyers or doctors or law enforcement. They're, they're, they're every aspect of society they, they belong in. And from various uh, walks of life, colors, cultures, you name it. And so Dr. G always stressed, he always has stressed and continues to stress humility. I, as a senior instructor, have walked into places and just sat there and watched them train and not said a word just to observe the class. I enjoy watching other people train as well. You know, it's not about me as an individual, but the, it's, it's to serve the greater good. But yeah, it is a what's, what was called an underground art for many, for many, many, many generations. It was considered underground. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the country of Myanmar, but there's been a lot going on over there. A, a little bit. It's a, it's a tough place to be. I think that's probably a good it summary. Is. It really is. That's to summarize. That is exactly what it is. But, you know, uh, we were gifted with uh, Dr. G being able to come to America. and He was a college professor emeritus at Ohio University. So he taught over there, he taught uh, linguistics, psycholinguistics, and I believe there's a couple other degrees. He has a degree in law. And so my point to you is that he just did not come to the States to live off a of bondo. He came and pursued his education. I love hearing the stories about how he had to, you know, uh, ride his bike from working all night to go to school during the day. And then, you know, he put his time in. And so he's not one dimensional. He's not, you know, he's, uh, he's really a, a wellspring of information to draw from. And every time I'm around, I still feel like I do when I was, when I first met him, mm. you know, so he's passed on this information and he continues to pass on. He's in his nineties. He's, he's, Rapid 90 in his 90s. He's well, well uh, uh, versed in this stuff. And so I, I consider it a privilege to have uh, been selected and I continue to try to move the system on. There are various approaches to it. Some of us go off into uh, teaching the science of kickboxing, some of us go into uh, a more combative approach dealing with uh, military and law enforcement. And then there's some that deal with the aesthetics aspect of it, you know, the forms, teaching forms and different things like that. And what did you do? 
I basically cover all all three aspects, but my strengths lie in the more uh, military and the combative aspect of it. Has that always been your interest within martial arts? It's it's, it's something that yeah. that we okay. I'll go ahead. Functional functionality is everything, but you know uh, you have to do what's called deconstruct in order to reconstruct it. And what I mean by that is, say for instance, you take a basic form. What is in that form? Uh, the Japanese call it bunkai. We call it deconstructing or deconstruction of a form to figure out what's in it to apply it combatively within the boundaries of combative truth. You know, the thing about you have fitness, form, and fantasy is what Dr. G always talks about, the three Fs. And you have the, the fantasy aspect of a form has to be removed. I mean, it is truly part of the form, but you have to understand that under the stress of combat, it may not go as planned. So you have to make the necessary adjustments in order to pull it off if, if that's what's necessary. Like you have the sport aspect of it with the grappling. Everybody's into the MMA movement. And I greatly respect and appreciate someone that will get in an octagon and fight for five minutes around on just about every known tool on the human body. I respect that. However, I think that in combatives, it's about getting the job done or self-defense, you know, which is another uh, piece that I, I focus on because especially now, for some reason, it seems like things are just kind of getting to the point where you have to protect yourself from all, from in all aspects of your training, not just the empty hand. How has your approach to your training changed over time? Okay, well, are you talking about besides age? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, one, of, one, of my, my, one of my favorite one-liner jokes is, uh, here's a picture of me when I was younger. Every picture is of you when you were younger. Show me a picture of you older, right? Well, <laughs> we're, we're, I, we're all going to get older, but beyond yeah. that, I, I've found that, you know, once someone's been training for 10, 20 years, they tend to evolve, you know, not only does, do their skills evolve, but their approach to their training evolves, how they train, sometimes why they train, when, where, who they're training with. There, there tends to be some, some shifts in there. And yes, it, I've got a feeling that yeah. that's been the case for you. Yes, it, it, it changed. And, and here's the thing. Um, when you're a student and you're hungry, you have to... You're hungry, you're training every day, or you just see yourself as a second coming of whoever. Whoever's out there that's popular in the movies. Oh, you're, you know. So when you get older, and I'm a, just to give you, I'm a grandfather. So, you know, I've been around a little bit. According to my grandchildren and my children, uh, I came over here on the first three ships to this country to establish America, okay? So they calling me old is what I'm saying. So I just chuckle, I take it on the chin, and I keep it going. Nothing like old age and, and treachery. I tell them, I say, youth and inexperience versus old age and treachery. Let's talk. Let's do a coin toss and see how that works. And so I we, know where my you know, money would be. Yeah, and and the thing of it is, is they will be uh, naive enough to watch the coin flip, and then it'll be over for them by the time the coin hit the do hit the floor. If you follow me, I do. That's experience. So. <laughs> how it has changed uh over the years i'm more refined the, the movements that or say gross large movements have become more refined you know exactly what you're doing it's more of a uh you become almost like a a, a doctor so to speak because you know if you use this particular strike a basic reverse punch or we have what's called a vertical fist punch we affectionately call it a midget punch because it's a short range punch. No pun intended. I hope I'm not offending anybody. You know, we live in a world now where certain words will get you in trouble. However, we that is one of the close medium to close range strikes that, that we use. And it's basically vertical as opposed to a horizontal uh, turn fist punch or reverse punch as uh, most systems have. We have it as well, but we call it an arrow punch. Now, the difference between, say, when I was in 
you know, when I was learning this thing as a teenager versus now, you know, you know exactly what's going on behind that punch. You know how to set that punch up. You realize that time is of the essence. You're not going to stand around jumping around and wasting time. You, you, you're, you're very efficient. You become more efficient as you age is what I'm say, saying, okay? Mm. And it goes from, say, a fist as a young man, a closed fist to an open hand or a fingertip, if necessary, as you age, to something even that's above those two particular approaches, your mind and your spirit, how you control the outcome of a given situation. You know, thinking is above all of the weapon system in Bondo. I mean, you can, you can have, you can be one of the most devastating fighters out there, but if you can't think yourself out of a given situation, then what's the point to me? Mm, okay. If you can avoid it all together, that's what's preferred. Dr. G stresses that. You know, you, you walk into a place and it's not to your liking, why stay around and have to possibly tear up, injure, or kill somebody? That's not necessary, okay? And so you say, okay, this place isn't for me. Let's go find someplace else, and we move on. That's what it's about. It, 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 philosophically, you change just like you do physically. Yeah, you begin to, uh, as you age, you begin to lose certain skills. You know, you do what you can to maintain them. But let's face it, age and father, father time gets the best of all of us. I don't care who you are. And We've seen examples of that, but the idea is to, as you age, is to age gracefully. So I work more on the breathing systems of meditation and concentration exercises. Um, the slow movement, uh, we have a internal system that is very almost cousin to systems like Sing Yi or Tai Chi, where the idea is to move real slowly and generate <clears throat> positive energy flow in the body in the form of blood. We call it uh, GA or GHA, which is internal energy, which is the same as prana from, from India and chi and the Chinese systems and um, uh, the chi. Japanese system, you know, have their internal systems as well. So it's all comparable is what I'm saying. So that's how my personal training has, has uh, changed a lot. Uh, uh, here's what I'm thinking. The Japanese have what's called ki. It's all relative, okay? Sure. So as you get older, you know, like my grandmaster is, is, is you could you can see it in his eyes, you know, when he speaks, and you know, this guy's nothing to play with. <laughs> you know how you are uh, as a kid. I was a uh, a bit of a mischief maker, and my mom seems to still think I am even in where <laughs> I am now in life. I beg to differ, but I think moms you know, always think that, Hey, you know, I'm, you can't win that no, you can't. mom, no, you cannot. wife, sisters, all that they, they gang up on me. So I say all that to say to you that as, as one gets older, the refinement of their system, um, you begin to specialize. Because in, in your youth, you want to master everything. Well, I think that's impossible because of the way things are configured. You can specialize in a given area and then branch out from there, which is what happens. But the fact of the matter is, I went from working on hard shin bone kicks, similar to the Muay Thai kicks, elbows and knee strikes, you know. Uh, throws to holds, throw, uh, blows to throws to holds, different things like that, which is a more external system. Now, I work on things like stepping and body angling to avoid injuries, pain, and or death. So where it took three moves to get something done, I strive to do it in one, if that makes any sense to you. It does. It does. I'm, I'm familiar with and have trained with some folks who are also working on that, that efficiency of motion. And I find it really, really interesting. Absolutely. Let's rewind the tape. Normally we start these conversations 
by finding out how you got started. And okay. we, we skipped over that. And that's okay. okay. That's okay. okay. But I do want to go back and I, I want to pose it as, you know, now that we've, we've heard a bit about the art that you're training in now, it, it's very clear that you've been training in this art for a while. I, I, I don't know that you said how long, okay. but it, it clicks for you, right? It, it resonates. And, and every, not everyone's first martial art resonates for them, but what you're doing now, you, you're clearly very passionate about. So let's go back. What was your first experience with martial arts? Well, <laughs> here we go. Back in the days when TV, you could look at TV, you know, and not have to worry about paying for it every month. Obviously, Bruce Lee was a big influence. Mm. I was a young young man, and I watched the, the, the whole Green Hornet series. And so as I began to, I guess about seven, 1973, late 73, 74, I had the privilege of running into some neighborhood uh, guys that were training in this art called Bondo. So my older brother in the system, uh, I'll put his name out there. His name is William Kane. And him and I were uh, uh, in the same general area, neighborhood, that kind of thing. So I had had a little bit of training by just basically looking at books and doing just some of the standard stuff that everybody that was enamored with martial arts would do. You got your books. Inside Kung Fu was one of my favorite magazines, and it would feature various systems. It was basically was a paper version of what you're doing as a podcast, if that makes any sense. It does, yeah. So I happened to look at this particular uh, article on the art of bondo that dr g had put out and so i basically looked at it and i found out that this this gentleman who is a uh, student down at, who was a student down at ohio university studied under dr g and he, both as a teacher communicator like i said uh, mr kane and i uh, formed a friendship he took me under his wing and showed me how to train and he seen potential so you know we would meet in backyards basements anywhere else we, we could train we trained okay and it was a little small group of us some neighborhood guys and as you know like with anything else a lot of us started and some of them fell by the wayside well the years have been good to me and i began to specialize and, and seriously trained, and I achieved my black belt, okay? And mm -hmm. so around, I guess around the late 80s, early 90s, specifically the early 90s, and the reason I'm doing recall is because it's been quite some time. I didn't realize how far, it's, how far back that, that went until you start asking me to dig up some things. So <laughs> I had a... Uh, after I got my uh, my my degree, I went on and opened up a school down in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I taught at uh, actually I taught at the Rec Center. I was uh, given uh, privilege and blessings to teach from there. I taught there for about six years and ran a self defense program and. Uh, all that went along with that. I enjoyed doing it. We got together, uh, I think, Tuesdays and Saturdays. And um, I taught there for many years. And then I had a school there for about, mm, I guess, about four years running. And then I went on and uh, retired from that. And now I'm just, how should I say, living life. I'm still training, but I'm working on some more. Uh, loftier projects, I'll put it that way, involving self-defense and uh, um, self-preservation. Mm. Sure. You know, martial arts is a, is a journey. And to me, you never stop learning. 
I mean, there's something I can learn something from you. I've learned some things just by talking to you about how to do this uh, podcast. I am very, how should I say, uh, selective because we live in a time when you have to be, you know, and you just never know. Um, I enjoy what I do. I'm, I'm basically uh, taking, you have what's called traditional martial arts or martial system. Um, and then you're taking it and paring it down to in such a way that the average citizen can, you know, everybody doesn't want to learn or study martial arts to that degree. So you have to uh, accommodate them. Uh, Self-preservation and protection of a common person should be something that, you know, everyone should be able to enjoy. So you have people that have physical challenges. You have people that um, just simply maybe just want a few things, a few techniques they feel that will help them get out of a given situation. I always uh, like to say that you want these techniques, but I think more importantly, importantly is uh, situational awareness, being aware of where you're going into, where you're, what's going on around you. Before you go in, during, and then even after you leave, um, mm. I think that's a big part of it. You know, you there have been countless times that you've probably read where persons are so-called whatever, and then they go to a particular bar and end up having to uh, prove who they are on some right. level. You know, there are just people out there like that. Let's, let's just be matter of fact about it. But um, I enjoyed what I'm doing. I, there's a healing aspect of it in the sense that you take um, healing stones and you work these basic postures and they strengthen the body. You can go from that extreme to, you know, again, learning how to protect yourself to the full combatives, as they're called, in order to protect yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's, I, I, I offer to, Say that I function somewhere between the, the self-defense and the healing side of it. The forms or the akas, I have them. I enjoy them. Uh, some of the younger uh, practitioners of the system, uh, we often get together and work on what's called deconstruction. Well, what's in this particular form and what's in this particular set? And you comprise, once you figure out what it is that you're uh, What's within the construct of that form, then you work on the application on a real individual. And then you have what's called time sequencing, where you got to figure out, okay, well, we'll start out with this slow and then we'll move up to combat speed. See, um, for me, you know, posing and I, I just don't have the temperament for all that. I'll be up front with you. Um, you see a lot out here, and it, and it teaches you to uh, be mindful, if that makes any sense to you. Of course. Of course. You know, you leave from your, your given job and go to your car. Uh, anything can happen between that point A and point B is what I call it, you know. So you have to be vigilant. It's not paranoia. It's just being aware. Situational awareness should apply to every place that you go. You know, if you have your family with you, you don't want to go into a place where you got to worry about not only protecting yourself, but your family. That's an extra uh, issue, if you follow me. I do. As martial artists, we spend a lot of time talking about the fight, you know, the, the actual exchange of technique. But you've brought up awareness and... and and such a few times over the last couple of minutes. Do you train? Do you teach that aspect, the, the pre-fight stuff, if you will? Yes, absolutely. Could you talk I about that a, bit, that a little bit? Yes, I think that that is above technique. I think that your, your mental and spiritual awareness of, a, of, a, of, a, of your environment, all that, in addition to what's called the topical or uh, the... Uh, uh, the terrain of where you are. Okay, for example, 
I use a often use a bar as a, an example because most bars are closed in and tight. The groupings are in terms of tables, chairs, uh, machines. You get you get what I'm saying. So your system has to tailor itself to that environment. That is not to say that every you know you have systems that kick above the waist. Their specialization is above is kicking above the waist. But well, those kicks are just as, as devastating, you know. Um, however, you have to figure what's more feasible in this type of environment. Can I get this off in this closed, closed environment? Let's modify it a little bit. Maybe some knees and elbows and some throws and holds could, could work best in this type of environment. Am, are you following me so far? I am. Okay. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Your, your, your awareness of your, your, your surroundings. Okay, and then there's what's called improv, <clears throat> improvised weapon systems. Okay, there's a chair, there's an ashtray, there's, there's pool sticks, there's everything else in that, in, within that environment. And so therefore, it's the awareness of what's there that adds to or it can take away from your technique, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I got that. Something to think about. It, it, yeah. One of the things I'm thinking of right now is that I'm wondering if you would be willing to do, I guess, describe Bondo. But, oh. you know, mo- just statistically, I'm sure, I'm sure you can agree with me. Most of the people listening have probably never practiced Bondo. Yeah. And I'm going to guess that most of them if they've seen it, are unaware that they've seen it. Okay. So if you were to relate it to other martial arts, you, you explain some of the commonalities, you know, in, in energy and certainly in, in structure, the, the forms, the combat, the application, that, and that sort of thing that Bondo has, as do other martial arts. What about the style of moving? You compared it a little bit to, to Thai boxing, to Muay Thai. But how similar is it? What makes it different? What what might give the listeners the ability to envision, I guess, what Bondo looks well, like? I mean, you the age old saying of you have two arms and two legs, correct? <laughs> two feet. Yeah. Okay, so there is just a uniqueness in the sense that I would venture to say that there are nine animal systems within the construct of Bondo. Okay. Just like in Kung Fu, these systems are uh, fully functional. The difference between, say, Let Wei and uh, uh, Muay Thai is more along the lines of, in the Thai boxing systems, they say that they're masters of the eight limbs, okay? The fists, the elbows, the knees, the feet, correct? Yes. Now, we have, uh, we, in addition to that, we have nine weapons because there's headbutting in, involved in that mm. uh, let's weigh. There are some versions of, of let's weigh, you know, depending on the rules that you use a lot of the headbutts in addition to the elbows, knees, and, and the uh, other stuff that's indigenous to that particular system. I'm not saying that the Thai people do not do it. I'm saying that the translation is that we, we have nine weapons. Uh, and that's not to say that one system is better than the other. It's just that headbutting is included. There are a lot of similarities um, with both systems because they did battle with each other. Now, there's a story going on, and I hope I get this correct, where the Burmese had captured a Thai king. Um, and the Thai king was told, that if he could defeat, I think the number is either 12 or 13 of these, all 13 of these Burmese masters, that he could be set free. He killed all of them using the Thai boxing system, okay? So the motivation obviously was for him to survive and go back home. So that, I think that had a lot to do with it as well, but the, what, what was going on, I believe, is that it, it was synthesized within Bondo at some point as a result of the, the uh, matches between 
Thailand and Burma, okay? And basically, as you know, each culture learns from another, and sometimes through warfare that's done. So there are a lot of things that are unique to uh, the Bondo system that that are like uh, indigenous to that as a result of the terrain, the philosophy, um, you know, like with the Thai system, they 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 uh, they do the same types of of of, of techniques. However, it, it may maybe give an inch or two difference in the in the torquing of the body or something along that line. That it just depends. And then you go from that level. The lift way is is basically how it's done. Is it what it may traditionally are supposed to be anywhere from three to five years? You do the hard bondo box. Then you promote up, and then you begin to specialize in a given animal system. Uh, the animal systems are, you have what's called the eagle, uh, the panther, tiger, uh, scorpion, uh, let's see, viper, python system. Uh, let's see, what did I leave out? Bull and boar system. Okay, and each one of those systems are known for particular weapons, human weapons, developing human weapons on the body. Each each animal system or animal master has a specialty, specialty, and they refine those things. Okay, for instance, uh, let's take an animal system like um, the king or the cobra system. Uh, the cobra system is used to, in, you know, there are knuckle strikes that are used to hit vital points on the body. Um, quick, efficient system, distance, stepping, body angling, uh, parries, uh, foot checks, hand checks, different things like that. It's a high science. Okay, that's one extreme. Then you have a system dealing with uh, the Python system. Python system uses medium to close range uh, grappling, the end result being strangulation of a limb or the body or the neck in that regard. That's not to say that they don't have kicking techniques and punching techniques within the construct of the Python system. It's the end result. One seeks to strangle and uh, uh, suffocate, and the other one is is basically you're shortchanging or short circuiting the nervous system in the body. Am I making sense to you now? I mean, you are. So, yeah. Okay. So it's very refined, and you do strive to become, uh, get to the level of being a doctor or a PhD within your given system. So then, okay, we went from Lithway to the animal system. You also specialize in weapons, are given. Our chosen weapon, our national uh, weapon that represents the, or shall I say, not weapon, but tool. I prefer to use that word. Um, the kukri, which is a uh, medium sword indigenous to, I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with the Gurkha mercenaries out of Nepal. Mm -hmm. They carry a kukri. It's a sidearm in addition to their given uh uh, firearms and the kukri is our uh, is uh, considered a symbol of our system. So you learn the kukri, uh, you learn the edge weapons, long sword, which we call the da, spelled D H A. There are different types of da. There's double da. There's the king and prince's da. Uh, there is uh, monk, or shall I say? The da is used in such a way where the blade is not even, it's not even drawn. They just they use their, their skill sets are so high that they just use the uh, da with while it's still in the sheath. The goal is to teach you a lesson. Uh, those are the two ex those are the three extremes in uh, blade work. Okay, then you have the same thing with the uh, stick. Okay, long, medium, and short stick, which is standard in all systems. Okay, so we've ascended to that that portion. Mm -hmm. So now we're going from, from those 
those areas in which I described up to the highest level, which is either uh, the monk or a waza, which means wizard system. And what that is, is you really are practicing uh, the mental and spiritual aspects of the system, okay? Say, for instance, the difference between you as a person versus 20 years ago, you know? I'm only speculating. I don't know your actual age, but you get what I'm saying. I do. It's an evolution of source because you have these tools and the ability to use them. Should you? You know, depending on the situation, you can get 20 to life if you make a mistake with this stuff. You see, so it's a trust is everything. You can't just go around arbitrarily wanting to beat up people because you, you study something as rare as something like this. And it's been entrusted in guys like my guys and ladies like myself to make sure that you screen a person. You don't want to have somebody run around here rough shot, uh, just being totally disrespectful to people in uh, society, and then not following the laws of the land. You know, we don't operate that way. So, the highest level, which is more along the lines of the monk or the wizard systems, deal with meditation, uh, a lot of yoga, internal healings, uh, self, you know, massage, massage in such a way the joints and the muscles and everything are line, realigned, breathing technique. Um, there's rope yoga. There is yoga where you take and you work on positioning the body since you don't have a partner. Uh, those three aspects of yoga are called uh, Leia, uh, I'm sorry, Letha yoga, Danda yoga, and longi yoga. Longi yoga is rope yoga. Uh, Danda yoga is yoga with a staff or a long stick, so to speak. And Latha yoga is two-person yoga, where you have a partner that that can push you past your particular limp range of uh, motion in terms of your limitations on your joints. In other words, they can help you push past that gently, of course. You understand me? Yeah. But the idea is to build the flexibility that we lose as we age, um, such things as sitting down on the floor and getting up off the floor, we lose that because we sit in chairs every day. Well, heck, you know, I found myself, you know, I sat in a chair for many years and then I, I started to lose that ability. So I had to reconnect with, uh, with uh, Mother Earth, so to speak. And reconnect and, and you can you know you can feel when you sat my, by my third day i was able to tell i was very comfortable initially when i start sitting on the floor just every ache and pain <laughs> <laughs> that there was was like hey remember us and so by the third day i began to you know they, in yoga they call it sitting bones where the bones of the pelvis and all that you begin to line all that up and everything becomes more um, pliable and flexible for you, you know. It's a journey. It's something that I enjoy. Um, when you are, it's a constant learning uh, piece. I said, you know, G means senior instructor and all that goes along with that. But to me, I am a master student. Some people say you're a master instructor. I'll, I'll, own, I'll take, take that, but I'm also a master student because without being a student, you cannot learn to become a master. And that, all the years that I've studied since 1973 and up to this present time, I'm planning on going to see my grandmaster here soon within the next month or so. It never stops. And one must always be willing to learn new things. I can learn from my grandkids. My grandkids teach me things. You see where I'm going with that? I do. It's a I like, life. I like to call it the white belt mentality. I don't. Yeah. I don't know if, if Bondo uses belts in the in yeah, the same yeah. color we way. Use, okay. We use a Japanese and a Chinese system of of uh, promotion, meaning that there's a sash involved. Okay. Um, you know the standard uh, white belt up to black belt. Uh, is is uh, how should I say that promotion process is that is there? We you traditionally have four belts, which are white, 
green, brown, and black. I still uh, adhere to that grading system or that promotion system. And it takes from uh, three to five years to get your first level. That's through the traditional approach. That's with training all the time. There are people that have gotten their black belts in three years, but they've earned it. Trust me. They sometimes they come in with uh, uh, pre previous ex experience out of uh, other systems. You know, all the guys that I got promoted under me, a lot of them studied different martial arts systems, and I welcomed them with open arms and just told them, you know, uh, just add this to your toolbox. And they decided they wanted to pursue um, more knowledge and information. And a lot of them, several of them have ascended to uh, uh, black belts and, and above. They're, they're doing very well. You mentioned you were going to get together with your grandmaster soon to train. At this stage in your martial arts career, at his stage in his martial arts career, at you said 90. What do you guys work on? We work on a lot of the philosophies and practices. Like I said, it's the mental and spiritual things, meditation, um, the yoga aspect of it, where we would, here's the difference. Years ago, we get together, warm up just a little bit, jumping jacks, push-ups, uh, squat thrusts, different things like that. Now, when we get together, it is, more along the lines of passing on information about ancient history of Bondo, uh, the masters, where these systems are, are indigenous, what part of uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, you know, it's a, it has like 150 different uh, groupings or ethnic groups or tribes, so to speak. And so he, he touches on a lot of that for history historical purposes, okay? Mm -hmm. And the higher level breathing techniques, uh, those types of things that are indigenous to uh, wellness and development, how to maintain yourself. You know, you get up in the morning, you got aches and pains, there are certain things you have to do in order to manage the pain. So, you know, you have a permanent and temporary pain aspects of living. So, you know, you take a uh, something like a short stick and then you work on uh, external limb massage where you, you're taking the, uh, the short stick and, and maybe working on your calf muscles. You know, they knot up on you. And so you have to understand their, their trigger points within these muscles. Uh, if you do these things and you do them uh, continuously, you'll reap the benefit. Well, there are some times when you know, you have an ache or pain in one of your legs and you sit down on the floor and you take this stick and you start pressing these, similar to acupressure, if I may make a comparison. Uh, you have these, these uh, energy points that are blocked on the, in the body and what these things do when you push down on them, it releases that energy and basically make, it makes you a lot more uh, fluid in your movement after you get finished with a session like that. Um, your feet, as you may know, carry a lot of weight. They carry the basic structure of the body, but however, they're also connected to the other aspects of your body. And a lot of people wear shoes all the time. And I say to everybody, make sure that you take your shoes off and just rub your feet for a few minutes to line them back up mm -hmm. and find out how you feel after that. It's amazing. So he teaches a lot of anatomy, a lot of psychology, a lot of uh, philosophy. You know, it's not just about taking a fist or learning how to reverse punch and, and all the things that go along with that. Um, to show you what I'm talking about, a reverse punch, as you may know, is a standard technique in most systems, if not all. However, if you take and add a step and maybe a pivot, it becomes a throw or a limb break. Okay, on one on another level. So the idea is to take these basics, these basic techniques, deconstruct them, 
and then reconstruct them on an advanced level and then going back now back bringing it back down to the basics if that makes any sense to you mm-hmm. sure does hmm. let's talk about the future okay let's pretend we get together you know 10 years from now or so and and we're recapping what's happened over the last 10 years, what would you hope that you would be telling me? Well, I would hope, first of all, beyond me, that you would want to take the system forward and teach others. Because it's not about me. I'm just a what they call a steward of the knowledge. I and My job is to pass it on and to see that it's passed on to a person's or person or persons of, of sound judgment because as with any system out there you want to have people in place that will be responsible and make sure that it's given in a way that's that respectful that's 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 uplifting um if i saw you in 10 years i would ask you about your personal progress and then are you what are you doing to move the system forward? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of masters, and Dr. G always stressed this. I can recall one time he said to me, you know, (laughs) we were talking over the phone. Actually, we were, I was present with him and he says, you know, you have enough information and knowledge that you can go step off and create your own system. And I personally took that as him wanting to kick me out the system. But reality, he gave me a high compliment, but at the same time, it may have been a test. I wasn't seeking to be, to go out and create the the second coming of anything. This system is very old. It goes back, you know, several, several hundred years. Um, It's a privilege to be a part of this thing. But I'm, it's not about me. It's about moving the system as taught by him forward to the next generation. You know, I have my, I have grandsons and granddaughters that are running around practicing a little bit of it. You know, you just give them a little bit of a, a taste of it. What they do as they get older, you know, they see me practice and then they, they mimic stuff and then they'll ask about it and I'll share it with them. That's the job of a Saya or a Saya means uh, instructor, but Saya G means senior senior teacher. And my job as a senior teacher is to make sure that it's passed on, you know, correctly and respectfully. And as you know, I ran a full service school for uh, four years in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I enjoyed every bit of it. I didn't have a bunch of students because we work hard. The yoga sessions are strenuous, but they're designed to build you and and uh help you grow in a lot of other ways. And um, so I have black belts that came in that I got promoted under me and stuff. And I'm always asking them, okay, what are you doing with it? What, who are you teaching? I like to see that type of thing. And like I said, this past Saturday we gathered and I was able to see all that unfold because it, you know, there was always a reference back to the teacher. And then I referenced it back to my teacher. In other words, this is not about me. It's about moving it on and then just acknowledging, hey, this came from this this master here. You know, I don't have it all to do to be caught up with me, 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 if that makes any sense. If people want to reach you, if they want to find you online, website, social media, anything like that, where would they go? Well, we have a, I have a couple of things out there, but I uh, have a, what's called professional self-defense and training systems and the number nine behind it, okay? Uh, that is usually, uh, I have a little bit of stuff on uh, YouTube, but I'm working on a, a project now involving a uh, group of, of uh, I teach in the school system dealing with kindergarten to eighth grade. And I'm working on a project with them, a character building, you know, I teach things like uh, an abridged version of of what it is I I was talking about earlier. Uh, The yoga, the meditate, the 
we call it reflection, not meditation within the school system. The idea is to pull, help to build character through uh, some fitness, through the martial arts, and then the, the uh, reflection where you're sitting down and working on breathing techniques and calming down, just listening to absolutely nothing or uh, some soft music to calm and, and help them calm and focus. These things are important to the future. So those two uh, vehicles by which I just mentioned, um, it's, uh, the, the uh, Professional Self-Defense Training Systems 9 is on Facebook. And you can look it up. I got some, some video up there. And then I, I'm working on some other stuff, like I said, dealing with the school system. And I just, you know, this is what I do. Um, it's not nothing fancy. I don't jump up in the air. I you know, I'm a pretty good sized fellow. But, I mean, combatics was always, the healing side and the combatics made sense to me. I'm an ex-soldier. You know, I, I, did, I did all that. And uh, it carried over. You know, I was able to go overseas and, you know, uh, Dr. G, stay in, stay in touch with him and, you know, he would advise me on certain things. And, and like I said, I learned a lot. And I'm still learning. Uh, I just got off the phone with uh, a Bondo brother who I've been called the task to do a uh, particular, he gave me a particular project because it, what's going on is that we're archiving all the footage of the traditional forms and different things like that. So I've been tasked as of uh, maybe 2.30, quarter to three, to go out and, and, and dig up some, some stuff that I've had dormant for several years. I was taught the system, but it, it, wasn't on the, uh, it wasn't on the top shelf, so to speak. So as of today, I was notified that I have to make sure that I do follow up and I've got to teach this thing, and I've got to put together a curriculum to teach it, dealing with the uh, our die or longsword system. So it never stops is what I'm getting at. I can respect that. I feel exactly the same way. It never stops. Never stops. Good. And shouldn't. No, absolutely. This has been great. This has been a lot of fun. And... I would love for you to choose how you send us out. Different guests offer, you know, some some words of wisdom or or sometimes it's a little bit humorous or or whatnot. But what, you know, what final thoughts would you have for the people listening today? Okay. Um, go back and actually constantly seek to refine yourself as it applies to your system how your system applies to everyday living and the innermost, I hate to say it this way, but the innermost mysteries, I'll use that word, mysteries of, of what it is that you're studying. On those three platforms, the platform of aesthetics, combatics, uh, and the sport, somewhere in between or, or between the three, you know, you have to ask yourself, how would this apply? Okay, if I have a suit and tie on versus a, a robe and, and slippers, how does my 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 system or art? Uh, how is it utilized? Is it useful? And just keep being a student. I don't care how much rank you attain. It's not the rank; it's the work you put in that really matters. If that makes any sense. Like I said in the intro, this one was fun. Got to learn about Sayaji Osborne. Got to learn about Bondo. Got to learn, got to smile, laugh. This is the goal of this show, is to connect the educational piece and the entertainment piece, and hopefully, in the end, inspire you. As you might imagine, I'm walking away from this one inspired, as always. So thank you, sir. I appreciate your time, and hope to talk to you again very soon. Check out whistlecakemartialartsradio.com for all the show notes for this and all the other episodes we've ever done. And if you want to support that work, you've got a number of options. Make a purchase at whistlecake.com. And if you do, don't forget the code PODCAST15. You can also share an episode, leave a review, 
tell a friend or contribute to our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Whistlekick. Don't forget, if you see somebody out there in the world wearing something with Whistlekick on it, make sure you say hello. And if you've got guest suggestions or other feedback, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.